Chief Executive of Globe International. And we all have, well, most of us, I think, have been in this for quite some time. Um, if I think back to what I was doing more than 30 years ago, my master's thesis was on women in parliaments. And what I was specifically looking at was what is the tipping point at which policies begin to shift? And what does the gender ratio have to be? And I was studying parliaments across Asia, across Europe, and of course at that time we knew that it was the Nordic countries that were much more advanced. Yeah, so they tended to have the tipping point was around 30 to 35 women in parliament, and that's when you begin to see a shift in the priorities which are set by parliaments. So here we are, more than 30 years later, and at a global level, we still have only a quarter of parliamentarians who are female. So that is moving upwards, and it's very asymmetric because in some countries, it's extraordinary. And I'm delighted that we have our Rwandan colleague here because that is the country which is top of the leaderboard right now. And unfortunately, the countries which are at the bottom of the leaderboard are those in the Pacific and those in the Middle East. So we know that there is a great deal, there's a real shift happening, and we can see that just in the leadership of the COP28. The lead negotiator is female. We have several ministers who are female. We have the high-level champion who is female. So this is all a reflection of the importance that the presidency recognizes that it has to also reflect to the world. So there's a shift happening within this part of the world, certainly. So what we've done this morning is to not focus on the well-known issues around the underprivilege and the disadvantage that women face in patriarchal societies, because we all are familiar with that story. So what we want to do is to reshape the narrative by focusing on the work that women are doing in an empowered way, exerting agency. So not the victim narrative, but the empowerment narrative. So we have four wonderful parliamentarians. The fourth is probably on her way. I know she is joining us, and I myself was late. And I'm sorry, but every day there is a new surprise waiting for us <laughs> in terms of the routing that we have to follow. So she will follow, um, she will join us as soon as possible. But so if I can just quickly introduce our members of parliament today. So on the far end, we have Senator Rosa Galvez from Canada, who is also the president of Parlamericas and somebody that we work with very closely as Globe, but more broadly a leader within the global parliamentary community. And to her left is Sahar Al-Bazar, who is a young parliamentarian, but young but very experienced from Egypt. And we have Francoise Oumakiza, who is with IALA, the East African Legislative Assembly, a member of the, Les the Legislative Assembly, but from Rwanda. And we will be joined shortly by Shatsi Mushurere, who is a member of parliament from Uganda. So what I will do is invite Rosa, you to start the conversation. So I've given you all a little bit of a homework to think about what would be the starting questions, yeah, to just get this conversation going. So you can reflect on your own journeys. Yeah, so really to start with, the basic question is, why did you become a member of parliament? What is your journey to where you are now? Good morning. Thank you, uh, Marlina. So my name is Rosa Galvez, and I am uh, Peruvian origin, but I've been living in Canada for the last 40 two years of my life. Uh, my profession is a civil engineer and with a specialty in environmental engineering. So through my professional life, I was uh, working on uh, water treatment, wastewater treatment, restoring uh, all mine sites and um, taking care of contaminated uh, lands. And uh, so my profession was very impacted by environmental legislation. And at the point, I, I see, you know, how depending on the government in place, in power, the environmental legislation will go up or will go down or will st stay. And so my profession was impacted by policy and by environmental legislation. So, of course, I'm a woman in, uh, you know, I'm a minority. I'm a Latin American origin. Of course, I'm a minority because I'm in science. And uh, I went to science and I was in uh, high academic administration. And yes, this is true that these are the challenges and there is few women, but there are also a space for opportunities. And it's the opportunities which most of us don't look at it because we are a little bit sad of the situation and doesn't allow us to look on the, uh, all the other things that we can accomplish. Of course, women are needed in politics because how can the decision can be good 
and good for the, all of us if only half of the people is taking the important decisions. Also, it's very important because we bring to the table some values, like for example, we are very good at negotiation. We are mothers and we have many children and we have to put order in many times and distribute tasks. And also because we look at farther in the generations, we look in the future. We don't just think about ourselves, but we take care of our past generation, our parents, and then the future generation, our children. We are very empathetic. We can very easily put ourselves in the shoes of others and say to the others, I've been there. I've been there, so I understand. Um, of course, climate change is not a, a problem that it came and happened in 24 hours. We've been building this issue in the last 60 and plus years. We adopted petroleum fossil fuels because that was the good thing to do at that time. But remember that we didn't abandon the Stone Age because of a lack of stones. We abandoned Stone Age because there were other tools. And the right now is exactly the same situation. We have better tools to produce electricity. We, ha we know better. And we know that our economic um, model, which is um, um, f infinite growth, cannot work in a finite planet. So our, our world is finite, limited resources, no renewable resources. And so therefore, this is very important to take in consideration. And again, women are needed in this field because of that. We are nurtured, we nurture the planet, we nurture the children, and, um, and we are very social individuals. We, we are the one maintaining the relationship with, uh, with everybody. Um, so I think that right now, the science is clear with respect to climate change. The technology is there and it's available and it's at the scale. Political will, I will speak for Canada, 70% of Canadians are for a stronger climate action. Why this is not reflected in the policy? This is a big question that needs to be asked. So what is missing? What is missing is the puzzle piece of the financial sector that needs to join in order to act as a catalyzer for moving into a low carbon economy. We need to go into the care economy, we need to go into the knowledge economy, and, um, and the circular economy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's an excellent, an excellent introduction. We're going to ask the same question to everybody. And then there are a series of other questions as we kind of dig into what are the policies and issues that you yourself have been working on, um, starting with some basic questions also. Next round around the proportion of women in your parliament. What measures have been taken to change it structurally to be much more of an appealing, conducive place for female parliamentarians? But let's come to you, Sahar. So you're a different generation, yeah, you're a young, modern Egyptian woman. So um, what made you want to enter politics? What was your journey to elected office? Sure, well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm so glad to be among you all. And um, I say hi to everyone watching uh, us today. Um, well, I, I have to say that my drive to be in an elect office came out of the drive of uh, my commitment to community services. I have been serving the community since I was 19, since I was a teenager. Uh, I've been volunteering for different causes in the community, in slum areas and others. And I have, I have been calling a lot of young people to join my movements when I work in service for the community. So going to the elect office was the natural next step to me. And I have been serving the community in different hats, whether I was a teenager and volunteering or in my jobs in private sector, because I have been working in private sectors, uh, companies in different fields, uh, but also in corporate social responsibility or social uh, investor in this company. Uh, and then I joined the government uh, for a while uh, as uh, an advisor to serve the community. So again, being an, in, in, in the elect office was totally the natural step to me. Uh, and I was keen to be in that place because I feel our role as legislators, uh, it will impact nationwide uh, uh, across Egypt or any country. Because the policies that you are doing and the bills that they are doing, they are voicing the needs of these communities and they will fix their, uh, uh, their issues and problems in a, um, 
more sustainable way and protect their rights. Um, so I felt that this is my, uh, my place. That's the first thing. And then uh, I've been progressing through years. And I have to say that it will not happen in, in any country unless you have the political will. Because in 1953, we had our constitution in Egypt that allowed women to run for elections. But since then, we had one parliamentarian as a woman, and then the numbers started to increase and then decrease, and then they say by election, and then they move it to be appointed only. So it, it has been ups and downs, ups and downs. And then in 2019, we had the right political will to empower women, and we put in the constitution that we should have a representation uh, percentages with, with which is 25%. And actually, now now we are 27% women, and that's a great prog uh, progress when you look at the historical numbers in Egypt. Uh, and I was one of the beneficiaries of this benefit, and I became one of these women. And six, and, and six months later, I actually ran for international elections, and I became the president of the Forum of Young Parliamentarians with the IPU, representing 179 countries. So it always begins with political will to push women and give them room. And you need women, as uh, the senator, my colleague Rosa, said, you need women in different uh, uh, fields. And being in politics is definitely one of them. And having the percentage of global women parliamentarians as 26%, that still low percentage. We need to increase this percentage and we need to advocate for more. And one last thing that I have to say, what uh, helped me and encouraged me to go to this field is seeing women parliamentarians. So we, being women uh, parliamentarians, we are using ourselves as an advocacy tool. I only saw, uh, saw uh, uh, a young parliamentarian just like me as a parliamentarian on the TV, and I asked my, myself question, why I didn't pursue this? Because I did my degree at Harvard in public policy, and I can help the community by this uh, degree. So when I saw her on TV, I got inspired. So I hope we today inspire a lot of young women to join the political field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaha. And you mentioned the importance of role models and the importance of gender quotas. Yeah. So next speaker, Francoise, you know something about both of those. So of course now you are with uh, the East African Legislative Assembly, which is the regional parliament. But you've been very active in the women's movement um, at a leadership level also in your home uh, country of Rwanda. So what's your journey been to elected office? For this floor, uh, I'm Francoise Omochiza, as she mentioned. I work with the East African Legislative Assembly. This is one of the, the seven organs of the East African community. And uh, I'm serving my second term as a Yala. So I passed my five years first, and now I'm serving for the very first year of the Fifth Assembly. Uh, I come from Rwanda. I'm really proud of my country, uh, though I'm here to represent all the EAC citizens. But I can't miss uh, to congratulate my country, Rwanda, for, you know, the path uh, from the ashes, you know, with the genocide against the Tutsi, 1994. It was a really a dark period. But now women have risen uh, to make sure they contribute to the development of our country. And I was a part of the privileged women uh, to have got uh, the, the impact of the good leadership from our champion of gender equality globally. Our President Honorable Poro Kagame, uh, I really take this opportunity to, to congratulate him for the efforts and the good leadership, especially by involving women into the leadership position. As we talk now, since we are members of parliament, allow me to tell you that in Rwanda, we, we have got 61.3% of women in parliament. And for your information, Rwanda also sent us, because we are nine for each partner state in EAC, uh, for Rwanda, we are six out of nine. Six women out of nine at the regional level. Others, they are between four out of nine and three out of nine. Because the treaty provides for at least three. 
out of nine should be female uh, parliamentarians at the regional level. So it's something you have to be proud of, uh, but beyond the numbers, I'm going to, to, to talk beyond the numbers. Beyond the numbers, women are working very, very hard uh, because they are also working the talk uh, as far as the development of countries are concerned, especially in Rwanda, because um, now it, it's like I'm um, kind of, uh, you know, I have got a, a, a dilemma, a dilemma to, to talk of Rwanda, most of EAC, because the EAC, I tried to calculate the, the percentage of women in the parliament, uh, because of six, then two, four, then three, 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 I got like a 16 point something percent. It's still little, but you have got the women caucus that is working on advocating for the increment of the number of women at the East African Legislative Assembly. And uh, as we are proud of Rwanda, and the SG of that caucus is from Rwanda, and the chairperson is from uh, South Sudan, but we are also trying to make sure the region moves the way of including more women, and women are supporting the climate change in terms of, you know, moving things forward, environmental protection. You know, in Rwanda, we have the good practice called Omoganda. Omoganda is the community work we do every last Saturday of every month, we do Omoganda, all the citizens from the age of 18. It's kind of compulsory, uh, but it has become a culture under the, what we call the homegrown solutions. And uh, it is very good uh, because uh, we, we support climate change mitigation and adaptation together as a team, as Rwandans. Uh, for instance, last time when I was still in Kigali, uh, because we're having our plenary sittings in Kigali now, as a Yala, uh, we joined the Omoganda at the local grassroots community uh, whereby even the leaders were there and the Yala members could ascertain uh, how moving together, collaborating together will advance the climate change issues and also tree planting, a lot of tree planting. The greening, Rwanda is now the first uh, cleanest city, uh, let me say Kigali, but Rwanda also across the, the country we are making sure uh, the, the country is green everywhere, but Kigali is the fastest city in Africa in terms of hygiene and you know, sanitation. So women are contributing a lot. And me, for my journey, as you asked, I'm not going to, to say a lot because uh, this is the, the, the good leadership. But from the good, the, the good political will, then we have also to make sure we go that way. We support the good, the good political will. It can't work alone. The will is not in itself enough, but we have to make sure we are also activists. We are drivers of climate change, you know, uh, mitigation and we are also accelerating this uh, purpose because we were given this trust, this confidence and uh, I have been the chairperson of the Rwanda National Women's Council before I was elected Ayala. Uh, this is very important to highlight because I worked a lot with the women in environmental protection, you know, renewable energy, like, you know, uh, friendly stoves uh, for cooking, you know, I guess, you know, uh, we, we, with a program called the One Cow, Cow Per Family. You know, women were really given value, and the, uh, Rwanda tried to pull up uh, women from the poverty, after genocide, uh, many widows, uh, but now uh, women are self-reliant, and they are engaged in many, you know, businesses, activities uh, to advance, you know, their economies. You know, climate change is about also finance. It's about finance, and without women's empowerment, financially, we can't reach to the destiny. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Francoise, um, Rwanda has been remarkably revolutionary, yeah, you have to say, because you are the own, one of the very, very few countries where you have a majority of female parliamentarians. Yeah? So that makes for a very different national dynamic. And I just want to ask you to clarify one thing that you mentioned, which wasn't familiar to me. Umuganda. Now, is that actually a day of community volunteerism? Is that, is that what it is? It is, it is, and it's registered under the cultural homegrown solutions, finding our own solutions from what we have, what is accessible, and from our culture. So every Saturday in Rwanda, there is the now a new the norm. The last Saturday of the every last month. The last Saturday, I see. So once a month, the last Saturday, there is a new norm, and the norm is that every Rwandan has to engage in their community. Yeah. Correct. Okay, very interesting. I've learned something new today. So coming back to you, Rosa. So Canada, like all of these countries, has never had a female head of state. But you have many 
senior women as ministers. And their path to power is also very interesting. I'm thinking of Christia Friedland, for example, who was a journalist. So if you can talk a little bit about the structure of the party, the party process, how easy it is to enter into politics, whether there are gender lists, what the current proportion is, how that's changing. Yes, thank you so much for the question. So we, we don't have the quota um, ratio or um, at, in the regulation or in uh, federal law. Um, women, slowly but surely, are occupying uh, political posts. And you are right, it's mostly at the ministerial level. And uh, we have the federal level and we have the provincial level. And we go down, when we go down to the provincial level, we will see that some provinces, there are more women than other provinces. I'm very proud to say that in the East um, Quebec Maritimes, the, the presence of women in politics, politics is higher than the, uh, the other um, provinces. Um, I think that we are encouraged, although in the last years there has been a lot of uh, media attacks. This, uh, the fact that now media and uh, all the, the forms that media can take, uh, there is less control or who is going to uh, approve messages. So a lot of vitriol goes into media, and especially is directed to, to women. And it is sad to say, but sometimes we are seeing it, not only in Canada, but also elsewhere in the world, polarization with respect to the, uh, the climate agenda. No? So we still have not necessarily climate deniers, but we have um, climate change um, uh, delayers, climate change doubters, and, um, and, and that is causing a lot of problems. So to talk about the legislation and where women is present, I, I am proud to say that uh, women in general have supported legislations in the key areas in environment and climate change. For example, um, um, the Environmental Protection Act that should be very important and should be basic to any country. So that has always counted with support of women because, again, of the issue with the toxic substances that can be at home, that can be in the market, you know? Um, also, Sustainable Development Act. That's also very important because in Sustainable Development Act, you have fighting to poverty, um, increasing education, which women are very for, you know, pushing children and their, and their, um, their, progeny, um, their children to higher education and to social mobility. Um, there is also, um, a lot of support on um, on this uh, net zero 2050 because we all know that we have to move into a, a low carbon economy and that for that government needs to support and so women are also of course uh, are present and of course for sure they are very present in everything that has to do with vulnerable populations like environmental racism you know we know that environment and pollution attacks severely to uh, um, vulnerable population. And when I talk about vulnerable population, you count indigenous people, you count women, you count children, and so therefore there is a lot of support of that. The, uh, we have passed in Canada a bill for um, the uh, ANTRIP, the United Nations Rights for Indigenous People, which I think it's also very important to have. And uh, hopefully, eventually, we will have a Climate Align um, um, Act uh, finance align with Climate Goals Act that will push the financial sector into the renewable energy and the circular economy and the low carbon economy. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Rosa, I know that you have to go very soon. So, before you do, can you speak a little bit to the work that you have been doing on financial accountability? Because I know that that is a key focus of your legislative yes. interest. Thank you so much. Yes, because I come to this conclusion. You know, every country has their environmental ministry or environmental department, and you see people really dedicated and uh, to do as much as they can. But they will go as far as where the money that they are giving is, is going to go. And so actually, the control is more into the natural resources department and into the finance department, which allocates the funds for everything, um, including, including for international, like the loss and damage, contribution from Canada, well, it doesn't depend on the uh, uh, Minister of Environment, it depends on the Minister of Finances. So, um, as I mentioned before, 
we know that the, the science is there, the technology is there, the, the public uh, outcry for more, for climate action is there. What is missing is political will and is the role of the financial sector. So this bill, what it does is to give um, a new duty to financial uh, um, entities to consider a superseding duty their alignment with climate commitments. Because in court, where, where um, it has been bring uh, by, um, by legal cases, uh, financial sector will say, well, my primary duty is to bring money to my shareholders. But at any expense, at the expense of destroying the planet, at, this, at the expense of polluting the atmosphere, at the expense of creating so much inequality, the answer should be no. The banks, because they are working with our money, it's our money, you know? It, the same thing for the pension plans. Pension plans are workers' money, and that money also should go into, with a larger vision to say, well, a worker will take its pension in 20 years, in 30 years. In, will it be enough money if we continue investing in fossil fuels? Um, we also want to eliminate conflict of interest. We know that there is a very costly relation between oil, banks, um, insurance, and, uh, and uh, pension plans, because it has been the business as usual, business as usual. And it's a world dominated by men, if, and I think I have to say that. And so where the, the major and the biggest priority is to bring money, but the price that we are paying is too high. It's, and politicians not sh shouldn't be worried about the cost of action. Actually, they should be worried about the fact that inaction is unaffordable. We cannot. Every single year, it is the hottest year in the planet, and it brings extreme weather events that destroy basic infrastructure. And this basic infrastructure sometimes is completely paid, but sometimes it's not paid. So insurance are deserting. You know, they don't want to insure any more homes, they don't want to insure any more municipal infrastructure because of the uh, risk of, um, of uh, extreme weather events. So the financial sector right now, it's in a very interesting position. On one hand, they are very scared of what climate change is bringing as a danger to them because of the destruction of infrastructure, because of the existence of a stranded asset, but at the same time, they just turn 180 degrees and they finance and facilitate emissions. So in order for a country to become net zero 2050, their own financial sector has to start now. Because remember that financial sector always is with loans and investment that last for so many years. So they cannot wait until 2049 to get to, to net zero. They have to start now in order to help their countries to become net zero in 2050. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, commend the efforts that you're making through your leadership on, on, the, on the bill in the Canadian Parliament. So I'm um, just coming back to you, Sahar. Um, so we spoke about the work that Rosa, Senator Rosa Galvez is doing in Canada on finance. I know this is a theme close to your heart though, so you've really thrown yourself into the agenda of international financial reform. But um, before we dive into that thematic area, it's very interesting because Senator Galvez is an independent senator, so she's not come through the party system, yeah? So, uh, but in your case, was there a party that champions? You mentioned that you came in because there was a gender quota, a quota for women, yeah? So was there a particular party that championed women such as yourselves? So, um um, the, the amendments in the Constitution was a collective work from uh, politicians from different political parties and of course the uh, NGOs that advocates for women's rights and other NGOs. Um, so it collectively formed this kind of amendments in the Constitution. And then now you have all the political uh, parties, they have specific committee for women and each political uh, party they have branches all over the country we have 27 governorates so they have offices where they can be very close uh, to women uh, in in city level in uh, rural area level all all levels um, so 
and, and again, we as parliamentarians, we get con uh, in contact with women through our political parties mm -hmm. and also with the National Council of Women. This is where we uh, get the support of uh, having women as focus groups to, to do the right bills for women. And actually we did work on like sexual harassment uh, uh, bills, FGM bills, and it's all passed now and it's laws. So thank you. Um, we, I do want to come back to the work that you're doing. So let's let's sure. not lose that focus. Um, but so you because you've spoken about the traditional quote unquote women's issues yeah. that women tend to begin with. Yeah. yeah. And if I think about the women that we've had in the Globe Network. So when I came into Globe, which is almost 10 years ago now, on our board was a member of Parliament from Japan, yeah. and her name was is Yuriko Koike. And Ms. Koike was Japan's first ever female Minister of Defense. Wow. So she didn't come into the usual route. Yeah. And she is now the first female governor of Tokyo. Mm. So it's interesting that you can go from that cabinet level, senior leadership level at the parliamentary level, and then move to municipal corporation, the largest in the world, one of the largest in the world in Tokyo. Yeah. So in your work, you've of course move from the traditional women's women's issues, quote unquote, to the work that you're doing now, where you're engaging right. with the IMF, the World Bank, the yes. other international financial institutions yes. on reform, specifically related to the issue at hand, which is on climate change. Yes. So if you want to speak a little bit about that. Thank and uh, I also just want to welcome Shadzi Mushirele from um, the Parliament of Uganda. Thank you so much. Welcome. <laughs> So, um, yeah, actually, I have started like a year and a half ago, and uh, I'm leading an initiative called uh, Ubuntu, uh, which is a South African uh, phrase that means I am because you are, and it's focusing on climate financing. Uh, and uh, I have to mention that it's co-founded by two other women, so it's three women and uh, one he for, sh for she. <laughs> so we are four co-founders, one from Egypt, one from Ghana, and the other one from Senegal, and the uh, male friend is from uh, Ghana. Um, so uh, we came together and we started this initiative calling the financial institutions to have more debt swaps for uh, climate adaptation in lower middle income countries and also to suspend the debt service because now based on reports africa itself if we are talking on one uh, continent level africa needs yearly around 50 billion dollars for climate adaptation and this year 2023 africa will pay 60 billion dollars for debt service only so if they suspend the debt service, we have a key and uh, an immediate uh, climate action. And also we were calling for a common framework for the lower middle income countries, like the one for the lower income countries in G20. So these are the requests that uh, we are calling for. And we have been joined by 50 countries from Global South and also uh, Ukraine as a lower middle income country. Uh, to join forces calling for this because of our countries um, that we can see it's burdened by heavy debts and we can use these debts in climate adaptation because all the money in our countries are being spent to pay back the debt and the, uh, the service of the debt. Um, and we don't have resources to work uh, on the climate adaptation. And if you don't work on climate adaptation now, you will get uh, crises and disasters that will be at that time it will be unsolvable so let's uh, work beforehand and protect our communities protect our countries and use the money that we have in hand and thankfully we got heard by the uh, World Bank and we got invited by the vice president and we met them in the annual meeting in Marrakesh and we uh, had um, this kind of interaction with him positive interaction and now we got the support of the UNFCCC and so we, we, we have been heard and uh, we're, but we're still advocating and the good news is that on the 1st of December in COP28 the World Bank announced that the small countries beside the islands, the small countries that are going to face natural, uh, natural crises because of climate change, they can be 
um, uh, like they will give pardon or uh, be uh, excused for uh, the, the loans and payment of the service of the debt until they are ready to pay back. So that's a good sign and we look forward to see the same uh, efforts for the lower middle income countries. Okay, very worthwhile effort. Thank you so much. So we have about 10 minutes left, so we're going to use that as best we can. So Francoise, let's come to you and let's talk about the work that you're doing specifically related to the COP28 agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was asked to mention, uh, to, to tell some data because data always informs decision making and also policies. Uh, so I have got some data because I've been in touch with the national parliament. I can't just leave you without having heard from this data about the women a representation in uh, different uh, you know, position of the country. Or leadership. Let me tell you that uh, I have already mentioned that women occupy 61.3% at the national parliament, but we also have uh, women senators uh, senator because, because you have two chambers. They are 38%. It's not bad as senators. Uh, and the two vice presidents uh, in the Senate are women, you know, assisting, the, of course, the, uh, the president of the, the Senate is a man. And we have uh, uh, women judges. Uh, they are 43 percent it's, it's a, a big number and we have uh, uh, women mayors uh, uh, finance and administration 30 percent is, is good and we also have uh, women in social affairs 78 uh, percent and we have women uh, councillors at the district level 45.4 percent uh, and the ministers as well the, the, the same figure and so on. And women are encouraged to create their own jobs. And most of them, uh, since they are based in the agricultural sector, uh, women are working you know, very hard to develop that sector and also uh, to deal with climate change and mitigation and adaptation uh, by using new technologies supported by the government, of course. Uh, fertilizers, bio seeds, all those things are also supporting climate change. And as far as I'm concerned, as a LA member, uh, personally, I'm passionate about climate change, and I also uh, tried to move this agenda forward under uh, various SDGs, uh, because we are moving uh, in the, the, le the lens of SD SDGs, especially SDG 1, ending poverty. SDG 2, uh, this is uh, zero hunger, uh, because uh, with the zero hunger and climate change, we are worried if we will really be able to end that. And I moved some motions uh, to support this battle. I moved the three motions. Uh, the, one, uh, the first one was about uh, gender equality in supporting the food nutrition and security, uh, whereby I was uh, asking the Council of Ministers uh, to make sure they, they enhance the access to nutritious food, especially for women, pregnant women and the girls in, in the community. And the second one was uh, to support uh, SDG 13 about uh, clean, uh, clean energy. Uh, whereby it was in during COVID uh, period, whereby women were having hurdles uh, to make sure they, they, they have, uh, you know, that they were at home with the domestic care work alone. Uh, and uh, during COVID, they, they, they were with the girls, the boys, every, even the husbands were at home, but they couldn't go out for fire with the collection. So it was at that time I moved a motion uh, asking the Council of Ministers to, to recommend the partner states. Uh, to enhance, uh, you know, accessible, reliable, and affordable energy uh, to, to, to support, you know, households, especially women and the girls at home. And then, uh, last but not least, I also uh, worked very hard with uh, UNECA, UN Economic Commission for Africa, to support uh, women's empowerment and, uh, uh, you know, SMEs uh, towards the African of trade area. Because without the finance, women cannot move forward uh, even to support climate change mitigation because we are heading beyond, beyond the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius uh, committed the, uh, in the Paris Agreement. So without uh, this education, without supporting women and the girls, we can't even reach this destiny. So uh, I think uh, I will continue to, to support this battle uh, together with my colleagues since I chair the Committee on Agriculture, Tourism and Natural Resources at Yala. So we will work as a team uh, to continue uh, to advocate for this. Already we have got some members here. Uh, Honorable Jacqueline, we come with this afternoon, among in, and also Honorable Dr. Woda, Jeremiah, that was here in the last days. So we are the champions, and we are many of us uh, through the platform we, we even initiated under IALA to make sure uh, we are drivers of climate action. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that with all of you, actually, that what we want to do is make sure that we are spotlight spotlighting you, profiling the work that you're doing so that you serve as role models to so many others. And it's been very gratifying to see so many female members of parliament who are here at COP28. And of course, Shadzi, you and I met for the first time in Cairo last year when you were there for COP27. And um, I'm sorry, it's been quite the journey getting here. Um, I'm delighted that you're wearing sensible shoes. <laughs> you made the transition from heels to trainers, which we all need to do. So, of course, um, Honorable Shati Mushirere, um, Honorable Member of the Parliament of Uganda. So I would invite you. You've seen the questions that, we've been, that, we, that I'd um, issued to you. If you can just wrap them all in one and then tell your story, please, and help us understand what it is that you're focusing on and why COP28 matters to you. Thank you, Malini. And it, it's, it's on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I apologize for being late, but I thank you for the opportunity to uh, sit here with my sisters I want to appreciate you because I was in Nairobi for the climate uh, summit, the inaugural summit, and I had your initiative on Ubuntu, which makes absolute sense because finance is just one of those big aspects of climate change. When you're talking about debt swaps and your initiative as a young parliamentarian in Egypt, I think you're tackling one of the most important aspects that we are maybe a bit timid to address, but it's very, very key. Uh, I'm Shanti Mushere from the Parliament of Uganda. It's my first time term in Parliament, and um, I'm really interested in uh, bringing more uh, more information, more more spotlight onto the legislative uh, work as parliamentarians in Uganda. Um, there is no way we can avoid climate change. We can call it any other name, but it ends up uh, relevant to our people, our women, our people in Uganda, our people in Africa. We contribute very insignificant proportion to the emissions of the world, but yet our women and populations suffer the greatest. And that is a fact. And so my focus now is on making sure we have uh, legislation that works to um, increase uh, finance for um, agriculture, smart agriculture for our, our people in Uganda, especially the women. Um, it's on making sure that we have youth and women and uh, policy makers understanding the relationships between um, climate change and uh, agriculture and making sure that we are in in whatever we are doing, we're uh, we're trying to reduce inequality. We're trying to improve the welfare of our people. Um, there's sometimes people don't understand climate change, but if you look at it from a, an angle of how can it help to reduce poverty or inequality, I think that's one area that we need to focus on as Africa. And I'm very um, very proud of our parliament. We passed our Climate Change Act in 2015. We have ratified uh, most of the protocols that we, uh, that we agreed on as a, as, as a, as a party to UNFCC. Um, but then now, here comes the question, what's the way forward? What's the way forward? We attend these COPs, we highlight the climate change uh, uh, challenges that we have but I think coming here to COP28 what I hope to uh, take away is uh, accountability yesterday I was listening to Senator J John Kerry and he was talking about yes we can talk about emissions but then how many lives are, are we are we saving how many how much uh, eventually what is the uh, how are we helping our people to improve their livelihoods. Yes, it, we are, there are issues of, uh, of emissions, there are, uh, but let's, let's bring it down to the impact on our people. And to me, that is really, really key. Uh, as government of Uganda, we are blessed with uh, renewable energy sources. 
we have water, wind, solar. We are capable of, uh, of focusing on those to improve the livelihoods of our people, reduce the inequality. Uh, so that is my focus. Where is the finance? How do we make sure it gets down to the, to the actual people who need it? Because we are at this level where we are talking globally. But how are we uh, making sure that uh, the decisions we make here, the commitments we make here, are able to uh, go down and uh, support our people? So there's so much we could talk about, but I'm so proud of the work that our African uh, uh, sisters and brothers are doing, the, uh, the Umuganda in, uh, is it Umuganda? In Rwanda. In Rwanda and um, several initiatives that they have brought up. But I would say that Uganda is uh, doing a great job but has more to do. Um, I'm so glad that we now have a parliamentary pavilion where we can address the legislative uh, uh, concerns, but also learn more because it's not my first time here. We are talking about smart mining, smart agriculture. There's so much legislation that that we need to uh, uh, do well, articulate uh, as we move into uh, different innovations that are coming as a result of trying to do smart, clean technology and clean energy for for our countries. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Atsi. And as you say, um, the mission here is really to use the pavilion to bring parliamentarians together, but also to connect you with the cutting edge. Yeah. So we're going to be having briefings on climate finance. So we're just down the corridor from climate funds, which brings together all of the major funds, climate investment funds, the, cli uh, the CIF fund, the GCF, etc. That's just one. Um, all of you are also going to be on panels. So uh, Sahar, we're going to have you talk about Ubuntu on Saturday, I think it's the eighth morning. And then uh, you're going to be joining us, Francoise, later today. We have a session which looks at political polarization and how you can develop consensus in parliaments for action on climate change. And of course, we have a session on sustainable agriculture and how parliamentarians in Australia and across uh, Asia and Africa are working together to promote that. So this is all very much, this is a hot pavilion because there's a lot under discussion, but our mission is really to bring you to the fore so that you can share what you are doing and you can develop new collaborations. So thank you for helping us end on time. Um, thank you for all our panelists, everybody who's joined us here in person and also online. And please come back for the next session where we're going to be talking about sustainable trade with an expert. So hope to see you then. Thank you very much.